and everything is blue and blurry. Kiss by sun, love by wind. We're so happy at this lovely place. No sorries, no worries. Let it always be a sunny day. Thank you, thank you so much for your patience, guys. My name is Jason. I'm your host for today's show. Uh, you're listening to the Brand Identity Design Podcast, and we are currently doing this series called as the Dark Side of Entrepreneurship. Nothing really dark about this series. Uh, we try to interview awesome entrepreneurs such as Ziza and many others who have been on my show, and we try to get the positive aspect of entrepreneurship. We want to educate entrepreneurs who are into this game about persistence, how to handle adversities, and and how to be the very best at what you do and and today is one of these topics you know which which i feel which all entrepreneurs uh, should practice and apply uh, as a part of their business which is called as expertise so we are going to speak about the value of expertise with ziza and ziza is going to actually speak on expertise and why becoming an expert in your field can fast track your status as an entrepreneur help you overcome some of your fear uh, such as on public speaking increase your earning potential in your industry make make a legacy leave a mark and an impression in this world so thank you thank you so much ziza for the opportunity to be uh, on my you know to 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 accept the opportunity to be on my podcast i'm really really honored uh, welcome to the brand identity design podcast i hope you're doing well how are you by the way Thank you so so much for the invitation, Jason. I'm doing very well and I'm very happy to see people in the audience. So I'm just going to say welcome to everyone who's joining us live. And I think we're going to have a pretty good conversation today because it's a topic that it seems a little bit obvious, but sometimes people forget about it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. People forget about expertise and how to develop expertise. I actually stumbled upon this quote. Uh the quote states expert were once amateurs who kept on practicing and the name of this guy is amit uh kalantri i hope i'm pronouncing his name right he's the one who stated this quote uh, it really spoke to me so let me guys give you an intro who ziza is and what makes her so qualified to actually speak on this so ziza is actually an entrepreneur a visibility strategist a public speaking and voice coach and mentor she's also a multi award winning musician writer performer and she has over stage experience of more than 22 years uh, she helps entrepreneurs become superstar in their business transition from being an expert in their field to to become a go to expert in their industry she also has a couple of bachelor degree and to be honest with you ziza i have never actually seen people having so many bachelor degrees you are one of those special individuals she has a, a bachelor degree uh, in communication science and journalism then she also has another bachelor degree in music and vocal coaching and the third degree the bachelor degree she has is theater and performance she also ended up getting her masters in media public communication and performance she has also worked with singers actors performers music composers you name it radio hosts journalists etc 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 the list goes on and on and on so uh, i'm going to play the sound effect the drum roll 
you know, because she is so cool. Thank you, Ziza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So let me actually start off with my first question. I really want the audience to know who you are and, and where this talent really originated from. So can you tell us a bit about your childhood? What was it growing up in Romania? And at what point in your childhood did you realize that you got this awesome talent about music, theater, writing, speaking? I absolutely love this question because for me, in this case, I was one of the lucky people who didn't have to search for their purpose. It just seemed obvious. This is what I wanted to do. I cannot remember one moment in my life where I didn't sing at all. I would sing ever since I was a child. My dad would play the guitar in the yard and we would sing together. And I think I was about seven or eight when my parents started to notice that I actually have very good musical ability. So I started my journey with music and they asked me if I would like to take some music lessons and if this is something that I would like to do when I grow up. And I was like, of course I do. I mean, I'm so happy when I do this. This is what I want to do. And then after I started to grow up, I realized that I have a message and that I want to be in front of people, not just through singing, that I want to share my message in all forms of being on stage. So this is how I started to go to public speaking competitions. And for since I was in high school, I started to get my first awards in public speaking. Uh, then I transitioned into theater just because it, it felt natural. I really believe that the best people on stage and the best performers are the ones who are able to combine music and theater and they rarely go one without the other. So this is what, why I was so passionate about these things. And growing up in Romania wasn't easy. It's not easy nowadays either, but in the nineties, it was just incredibly difficult. But I grew up with this huge dream of being on stage, of being in front of people, of sharing my, sharing my voice with, with people. And of course, it seemed so far away because it was a difficult life. And I grew up in a very toxic environment, a very difficult one from every single point of view that you can think of. So it seemed incredibly difficult, if not impossible to achieve. But that desire that I had in my heart would never go away. And this is how I ended up here. In time, people started to ask for support to mentor them, to teach them what I know. Because growing up, as you, as you probably realized, and as you also mentioned, I try to be as good as I can be by learning how to be in front of an audience from different perspectives, not just with music, not just with theater. I wanted to learn radio. I wanted to learn being on TV. I wanted to learn uh, what it's like to be in front of an audience when working with the film industry. So to me, that, would, that meant being an expert at being in front of audiences. And I was just so passionate about it. I wanted to see every single facet that being on a stage uh, can bring into my life. And this is how I ended up here. If I can put it in a very short story like that, Jason. That is very, very powerful, Ziza. I appreciate the fact that you, you know, you kind of gave me the whole premise of, you know, how your creativity, your artistry, your mastery started, how it naturally progressed to you, how you saw opportunity out there, you know, to cultivate, to harness and make it even better. And then you're transitioning towards public speaking, which was a natural progression again. So thank you so much for giving uh, these valuable insights of how your journey was. And, and I understand Romania because I had a guest who was actually from Poland last week. And he said some some of the struggles uh, about communist Poland. So I, I can understand, you know, sometimes when we are growing up, especially in the 80s and 90s, things could be very, very challenging. I'm so glad uh, that you were able to, you know, come out of those adversities and be the person whom you are. So that takes a lot of courage. I applaud you for that. I wanted to give a shout out to all the people actually on LinkedIn. We have Ranu, Damien, Alma. Uh, Thomas, my good friend, and, and Crystal, you know, from LinkedIn. And I also want to thank my good friend, Melissa, Mombato, Mays, 
and more who just joined you know thank you guys for your love and support so if you're actually listening to this conversation please remember for the first 30 to 40 odd minutes is going to be just a a one on one conversation between me and my guest if you do have questions for Ziza please hold on to those questions we will start Q&A after 40 minutes you will have the opportunity to ask as many things as you desire uh, you know to my guest clarify doubts whatever she spoke on the show so moving to next the next question which i have based on your professional opinion ziza since you're into public speaking and all those fun stuff exciting things what is the difference between knowledge and expertise and knowledge can also be trans you know translated as experience versus expertise i love this question it's a really interesting one i believe that knowledge becomes expertise when you know how to implement it as well and when you add the experience to it so knowledge for example let's do a little analogy i go to school to learn how to play the piano for example that's knowledge and then i start to play the piano let's say i have these opportunities to do some concerts for a year or two one year or two years or three years that's experience merge these and add the experience of being on stage maybe playing with other people interacting with your audience and discovering all the obstacles all the difficulties and all the mistakes that can happen through this experience when you put all of these together this is how i believe you create expertise that's a lovely answer very simple <laughs> and short and very very powerful thank you so much uh, ziza for explaining that according to oxford english dictionary uh, you know the word expertise uh, you know it comes from the from, from latin it's called expertus uh, and it means to try or test in other words expertise involve a strong element of practical application like ziza said it's not just uh, you having the knowledge but you also putting all the extra layers which you have gathered over these years uh, the ideas which you have the implementation you have making the best out of it uh, i i think when i researched about it another example which i got was like an electrician wiring up the new house a scientist trying to discover new things or a lawyer applying their knowledge uh, of of you know certain rules and regulation in particular cases so thank you you know ziza i appreciate that now how were you able to decode this in in a very simpler fashion was there something which you did in your professional career which help you to understand the value of expertise personally i wouldn't say it's just one thing but i realized in time by making a lot of mistakes and going into contact with audiences in every single environment possible i realized that i became better and better not just at speaking but also at performing at interacting with people the more i did it and the more i understood my world in depth the more i read books the more i learned things from different industries and i was able to make connections between ideas and i would study and understand human behavior psychology processes all sorts of processes that happen in our nervous system and i could connect them with the experience that we have on stage the more i learned and the more i developed myself as a human being the better speaker i was and this is how i realized that in order to be a good speaker you have to know your stuff of course you can start as a newbie and you can practice and you will be pretty confident and you'll do a pretty good job but the more expertise you add to the speaking skills the better you are because you can add good impeccable arguments you can make incredible connections between ideas all sorts of things will pop into your into your mind while you speak and you will be able to say things that people will quote after Yeah absolutely absolutely that makes total sense let's actually deep dive into this conversation a little further now i don't know if you have heard about the dreyfus model of skill acquisition something which i stumbled upon uh the dreyfus model actually explains about the five levels of expertise do you have any idea uh about uh, this this model by any chance isa 
Yes, yes, I do know about it. Okay, can you give our audience a little overview? What are these five levels and why it is important to understand these levels before you get into you know becoming an expert? Yes, absolutely. And I actually think that we all know about these stages, but we just we're just not aware of them. Um, it's basically like every single journey that you have whenever you learn a new skill, even I like to I always like to share analogies when I when I um when I give an example or when I share a piece of information because it's much much easier to understand. So let's imagine that we think about a basic skill like cooking. And you go through five stages of development. The first one is, of course, novice. So you're a newbie. You're just getting started. And maybe you, the only thing that you know is how to fry an egg. That's the novice stage of expertise. And then after that, after you've learned how to fry an egg, for example, maybe you want to learn how to do pancakes and you continue to practice the pancakes part until you know how to do pancakes and then to fry eggs properly. That means you're an advanced beginner. So you only know how to cook a couple of things, but you know how to do them pretty well, which means you're an advanced beginner. After that, you start to get more open to test new recipes. So you still use the recipe book, but you started to test more and you start to cook and things are going pretty well. That means you're quite competent. So you are able to follow the recipe book and you are able to do a pretty decent uh, recipe, which people think it's, it's pretty tasty. That is level three. After that, you start to get rid of the recipe book. You start to experiment and you start to see, hey, what would happen if I would replace this, I don't know, cocoa powder with a different ingredient like turmeric or cinnamon or whatever, and it turns out good. That means you're proficient. It means you have learned what every ingredient does in combination with the other ingredients. So now you're able to experiment with them. And the final level, which is expert, I think that you can achieve that one by continuing to practice the proficient part, always improving and mastering the details. An expert is a person who is a master at details. They know every single thing that they work with. They know what it does in relationship with other ingredients, for example, and they know how to maximize their potential. So these are the five stages of uh, skill acquisition. That is super lovely, Ziza. I, I think you have this natural gift of explaining things in a very, very simple way with examples. So I really appreciate this, you know, guys. So just in case if you if you are interested in getting the Dreyfus model, uh, you know, I have like a PDF which I acquired from the Internet. So I should have it on the show notes once this podcast uh, gets uploaded and uh, broadcasted. Okay, on all audio-based broadcasting platforms like Google, Spotify, Apple, etc. So moving on to the next question. And once again, you know, Ziza, that was a lovely explanation. So five stages of expertise, guys. Novice, advanced, beginner, competent, proficient, and finally, an expert. The expert who does not really care about the recipe book or the ingredients. Uh, you know, I think he cares about the ingredients, but he's, he or she is willing to experiment and try new things have a better holistic understanding of, uh, you know, how to develop, you know, his or her craft, right, Ziza? Yes, absolutely. I would say that in this case, if we were to go back to the recipe analogy, an expert is someone who knows the ingredients so well that even when he develops a new recipe, he will know what the outcome might be before he starts to cook the thing. Hmm. Interesting. So, so the person is well aware of the outcome, uh, you know, while they are trying to actually make it. So that's, that's pretty interesting. All right. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Let's actually move on to my next question. So my next question is how to become the go-to expert in your industry. And if you can explain us uh, some of the practical steps which people can take, Okay, setting aside the example of recipe and cook, you know, let's let's take a 
le- let's take an industry and and if you can narrow it down and break it down because people generally have this question what makes an expert H- or which area they should become an expert in how long do they have to work to become an expert and how can you become an expert in anything you know so those kind of questions so if you can answer that that would that would really you know i would really appreciate that yes this is a great question how do i become the go to expert in my industry and again we're going to go and use an analogy for example let's imagine that you are an expert in health or maybe you're even a doctor or someone who specializes in uh natural treatments natural healing and well the first and most important condition to become a go to expert is to be an expert first and usually these are the people who get the best results out of my work because it's just a matter of knowing how to put themselves out there so that people start to perceive them as the go to expert so what is the go to expert it's someone who was able to create brand recall basically when you say for example health coaching or natural health remedies you think about that person first and of course you will be the go to expert in a specific group in a community it's it's incredibly difficult to become the go to expert in the entire world <laughs> it's just probably i don't know if we were to think about <laughs> huge icons like tony robbins yes he is the go to expert in his industry of life coaching for example but you can become the go-to expert in a large community those people who attend your trainings and who experience your work and who access your resources they go to your stuff first they think about your name first when they say when you say health coaching your name pops into uh, into their minds this is how you, this is what it means to be the go-to expert it's the first person that they think about when they need help with health coaching How do you do that? Well, as I said, first and most important step is to be the expert already. So you have experience, you know how to solve those problems, you know how to treat various illnesses, you know all of those remedies, you know what problems might come up, you know what struggles your people might have. This will actually make the journey of becoming the go-to expert much shorter and much easier. And there is no short cut to becoming the expert i have to be honest being an expert requires years and years and years of practice every single person that you see uh that has a lot of ease when doing something they've spent many many years perfecting that thing and that craft so there is no shortcut to that but let's say you have some years of experience and now you want to transmute it into a business you've become an entrepreneur and now you want to start to put yourself out there more and this is how experts have very fast business success they have expertise in an industry and they transmute all of the skills and turn it into a business this is how i uh started my business my business is still a baby but i was able to achieve pretty fast success because of all of these skills that i had on stage for 22 plus years i've just transmuted them into the business and i've applied them this is how you become the go to expert first and most important step you are the expert already second think about building up your visibility you don't need to work on your skills so much now is just a matter of how can i make more people find out that i'm super good at what i do this is what i did from day 1 and results were absolutely incredible it's about showing up in as many places as you can where your ideal audience hangs out and it's very difficult to give you an answer with this one show up there show up on instagram show up on linkedin it really depends on your target audience on their behavior and where they show up but the idea is to try to cultivate omnipresence this is how i like to call it show up in as many environments as possible don't rely on a single platform and not just social media find a way to create a strategy where you show up in as many places as possible to create brand awareness so this is the first step like the second step let's say after you you've decided that you want to become the go to expert you start to create brand awareness people need to know what your brand is about after that you start to create familiarity more and more people know what your brand is about this comes through consistency when showing up after you've created the familiarity with it comes trust that's when people start to buy from you 
they trust you. They usually go hand in hand, familiarity and trust. The more familiar your product and your brand is to people, the easier it is for them to buy. And it all comes through visibility. It all comes through showing up. No matter how good your sales systems are, if you don't show up, nobody's going to know about your product or service. And after you've built up the trust and people started working with you, you have one of the most powerful tools, marketing tools ever, which is social proof. More people will start to talk about your services and how incredible they are. They will be because you're already the expert. Word of mouth is going to spread. I absolutely love word of mouth as a visibility tool. And I always advise my, my clients when working together, I teach them how to maximize the impact of their social proof so that more people can say, she's the best expert to work with in terms of health coaching. And it's enough to have two or three people who have a huge network working with you. After that, it gets easier and easier and easier. More people will mention your name as the best person to work with on this specific thing. And this is how you become the go-to experts. <laughs> Sounds easy. That's a lovely, <laughs> that's a lovely yeah. answer. But you know, it was very, very powerful, like a nuclear bomb, Caesar. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It requires a lot of consistency and a lot of showing up. It's just, I like to use this analogy. It's just like when you open up a store, you have to put the banner out. You have to open up the door. You have to tell people about that store. It's the same thing as with any kind of business. That's that's well said. That That's really true. I wanted to just amplify on, on what you said. You know, guys, the, the basic is that get all the resources, education you require, first of all, to to lead to that level. You know, have, you know, it can be courses, can be a degree, whatever, you know. Uh, then and start implementing like you know uh, like write blogs articles vlogs you know put content out there okay and the same time read books because knowledge is a never-ending process you have to continue progressing as you progress in life you know because change is inevitable uh, y you can't get stagnated okay do more speaking gigs throw more content out there like Jesus said you know be omnipresent as you progress ahead and and you would get there you know and it's not a not like a a goal which can be achieved right away it it does require you to be very very disciplined i always say that guys you know more than motivation guys i think discipline is the key because you can be motivated at one point and you may not feel very motivated but if you're disciplined and if you're being consistent the effort and the work you know still continues to drive and push you ahead in life that was just my thoughts, Isa. Is there anything you like to add? Yes, I completely agree. Uh, because I think this is how I see the difference between discipline and motivation. I see motivation like a cup that can get empty if you can if you constantly take the water out. So it's something that runs out. While discipline is a muscle. The more you work it, the stronger it gets. That that's phenomenal, Ziza. I want to actually, you know, uh, you know, brainstorm on this conversation a bit more. So I want to start off this quote uh, by Isaiah Berlin. Uh, Isaiah actually speaks about the fox and the hedgehog. I'm sure you guys may have heard about this. A fox knows many things, but a hedgehog knows one big thing. Okay, so in the form, in the famous essay by this Oxford philosopher named Isaiah Berlin, he divided thinkers into two categories, hedgehogs and foxes. The distinction comes from the saying uh, of the ancient Greek poet Archeolysis. I think that's how he pronounced his name. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one thing. Hedgehog have a single grand idea that they apply to everything, while fox comes up with new ideas in every situation. Now, Berlin argues that Plato uh, was a hedgehog and Aristotle and Shakespeare were foxes. Okay, and there was a few articles on Wall Street Journal and I also read some blog articles by Jim Carroll about this. So, now the reason I'm highlighting this specific uh, quote is because the generalist and the specialist, there has been a big dilemma which has been out there for a really, really long time and people battle. Now, some say that the generalist is good and some say the specialist is good. And even you're also saying the specialist is... 
is good i've also heard many people saying that a combination of both also makes sense so what is your thought about the generalist versus specialist dilemma well first of all i will say that i'm definitely a fox <laughs> so i'm that person who has a million ideas and who knows a lot of things however they are all re- related to my one big expertise i'm a specialist in one big thing and i know a lot of things about it from different perspectives so i wouldn't say that the hedge hedgehog is a specialist and the fox is is a generalist i would say that there are just two different types of human design one is someone who is very focused on one big thing and they ex- and they get super mega good at just that one thing whereas there are other people like myself who are able to do multiple things they, they are multi passionate they're able to merge them somehow and they're able to do them very good but i think that i don't think there is anything wrong with a specialist or with a generalist i love being a specialist because i'm that type of person who likes to go deep into the knowledge of that one thing and this is why i know so many things about this from different angles because i want to learn about it from as many angles as possible but they all boil down to one big thing one big specialty that i have which is being in front of audiences someone who's more general list i would it doesn't necessarily apply to all industries i would say for example if you have doctors they can be generalists and that works fine they are like the opening point the starting point you go to them with a the problem doctor i have i don't know these this kind of headache and i have this type of pain and they will say it seems to me that it's this or this or that and then they can direct you towards a specialist go and see that specific person so you start with a problem you have no idea where it comes from you go to the generalist to guide you and they open up the door so you can go to someone who has a more specific expertise on that to solve it yeah absolutely i i agree with you 100% i think the market uh, can suffice and take care of a generalist and even a specialist it depends upon where you want to position yourself uh, it also I, i i think what you get paid also matters i i i think a generalist would not get paid that educate in comparison to a specialist because of the expertise they have harness but i really like what you said uh, it's okay to be a fox okay as long as the end goal or what it's leading to it's one specific idea or you know a skill set which you have you know i really love this uh, you know explanation a lot zisa thank you so much for sharing that i actually watched most of your videos which you had uploaded on youtube uh, which you were a guest some some of the videos which you posted and i really came i stumbled upon this explanation which you have about the fear of public speaking uh, it's actually not real it's something else but we misinterpret it as the fear of public speaking so tell us what your professional view is uh you know why it is not really the fear of public speaking that is which is affecting you i came to this conclusion after experiencing stage fright for more than 15 years myself and i spent a lot of time trying to get to the bottom of it why cannot why can't i fix it why am i still struggling with it i've been on stage for so many years i know how to do it why am i still scared and i would try all sorts of tools and modalities and exercises to fix this breathing and meditating and visualizing and whatever it would only solve it temporarily i was only solving the effect and not the cause and it took me a lot of time to understand that my fear was coming from my self perception from my relationship with myself which was not very balanced i would fear judgment I was constantly judging, judging myself. I was going through extreme perfectionism. Nothing that I would ever do was good enough. And I realized after studying myself for a while that this behavior manifested in my relationship with others on a daily basis, not just on stage. And this is when I realized it doesn't have to do with the actual stage, with the actual speaking. It has to do with our fear of having Uh, our vulnerabilities put in the limelight all of a sudden people can see that i'm vulnerable they can see that i'm scared of their judgment but it's still there even if you never go on stage ever 
if you have this kind of fear, you will probably be scared to, uh, for example, ask questions or voice out some, some of your concerns or to speak up when something bothers you. And this is what I would do on a da daily basis. I wouldn't really express myself. When I was able to solve my relationship with myself, stop seeing myself as not good enough, that's when I started to get rid of the fear of being seen. It's actually a fear of being seen and it's a fear of having our vulnerabilities put in the limelight. You're not scared to speak. If you were to speak all by yourself in your living room, you won't be scared, which means the actual action of speaking is not the problem. It's how you perceive yourself in relationship with others. Lovely, you know, and I love this explanation so much because uh, when I relate to this explanation, it makes total sense because I am still fearful of public speaking, irrespective I run a podcast and I speak in public, you know, I'm just saying like I still, if you put me in a crowded environment, it's still, you know, I will still shake and shiver. But, you know, I really... I, I think the conclusion you came up with is, is spot on. It's your vulnerabilities and it's about how people perceive you when you're speaking. You don't want to be judged. You don't want to be laughed or mocked at. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we try to create this shell around and we fear this whole speaking thing. So I, I love uh, I love the share, Ziza. I just want to let the audience know on LinkedIn and clubhouse we are starting q a i just have maybe a couple more questions so if you're on linkedin uh, please raise your hand and i would only be bringing people up who have been listening to the show for the past 20 or 30 odd minutes because it makes sense uh, because you understand the context of the show so please raise your hand please feel free to come up uh, ask questions to ziza if you have any any doubts anything you like to contribute do not hesitate and uh, same goes with people on linkedin uh, sorry on on uh, clubhouse i have actually invited a few people to come on stage uh, if you have got my invitation please accept it if not uh, feel free to raise your hand. I'll be happy to bring you up. So Ziza, my next question to you while the audience is joining us. My next question is that, is there anybody uh, in your family, friend circle or mentor, anybody who has influenced you uh, to pivot to this direction, to become a coach or to reach where you have reached today? It's not just one person. I have a few teachers that and mentors that I love with all my heart, I've learned from them basically every single thing that I know about music, about theater, about being in front of audiences, about radio. So my expertise is built upon their expertise. And of course, I added my take on it and I've merged every single thing that I've learned. And I cannot, I cannot put my finger on becoming a coach and a mentor. I know it's something that hit me all of a sudden one day. I would work with people. I used to work with people in the past years and uh, they would ask me to mentor students or performers. People would ask for help. But one day last year, it just hit me all of a sudden as it was as if I would wake up in the middle of the night and I thought, I have to start a business and this is what I'm going to do. I know all of these things and I can definitely help so in terms of becoming a coach and working with people globally it was uh, well I, I don't know what happened but I think we lost audio uh, Mace you're on stage Can are you able to hear me I don't know if it's my connection yes I can hello yeah okay so we're just going to wait for Ziza to come back on stage. Uh, I just want to say I'm good. that I don't know if you can hear me because I was speaking. And <laughs> I don't know if you were able to hear technology, what I said. Technology is screwing it up. But, you know, it's cool, Ziza. I just wanted to say, Elizabeth, I, I saw that you raised your hand. Uh, why don't you lower it down and try again? I will try to bring you up. And, and Ziza, please, please go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you back there, but we were not able to hear you. Oh, just tell me what was the last bit that you heard. Yeah, honestly, I was doing multitasking. I don't remember. <laughs> okay, let me go back to the question. So you've asked me whether there is a teacher or a mentor uh, that I can think about in terms yeah. of Biggest me influence. becoming a coach. Yes, and you said there was not yeah. one. There were many things. 
Yeah, yeah. So in terms of building up my expertise, I have multiple teachers. Uh, who helped me become as good as I am today. And then in terms of starting the business and becoming a coach, it was sudden inspiration from God. It just hit me one day. I was like, this is what I want to do. I have to do this. <laughs> it was just very uh, sudden, but I'm very happy that I followed that, that huge nudge that I had on that day. Awesome. Awesome. I, I love that so much. So thank you so much for sharing it. And I had just one more question before we start Q&A. So everybody wants to leave a legacy. Okay, well, tell me what is that one thing you want to be remembered for the rest of your life? For giving people their freedom, giving people that sense of freedom and opening up their eyes because in the end I cannot give anything to people I can't make people free but this is what I want people to feel when they experience my work when they start to implement what we do together I want them to feel free free to be themselves like who they truly are free to express themselves freedom is the biggest thing that I value in this life freedom to be who you really are and if I can support them and open their eyes open their vision and help them see what they need to do to achieve the freedom that they want, their definition of freedom, this is the kind of legacy that I want to create. That is super powerful, super powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So so let's actually start with QA. and I, I see Maze who joined us on Clubhouse. Thank you. That's a really cool hat and a lovely name you have there, ma'am. So do you have a question? Is there anything you'd like to contribute uh, with this conversation we're having today? Hello everyone, this is me, like and amazing, and I'm a raving fan of okay. uh, I, amazing. Yeah, so amazing. I, I, I think you're breaking up. Uh, would you mind maybe adjusting the the phone to Yes. Okay, go. Let's let's try that again. We could not hear you. Could you could you say that again? No worries. Is it better? Excellent. So first off, I'm a huge fan of Ziza's. <laughs> She's a huge inspiration. Um, Ziza, I put in the chat area, have you ever heard of a singer called Melody Gab Gar Garbart? I, I always say her name wrong. You've heard of her before? You remind me, she has a beautiful story um, that is very inspirational and in where she got her courage from. But my question to you is, where do you, like, your inspiration, you'll come up with topics I mean, I know you <laughs> are somebody that is definitely detailed oriented, but how do you get the inspiration to come up with the topics that you come up with when you begin? My inspiration always comes from two directions. I would say that both stem from the same one, but number one is, as I've mentioned earlier, it's divine inspiration. It comes from God. Those moments when it just hits me all of a sudden, I know for sure it comes from him. And then I get inspired from people. As you said, I have a very good eye for detail. And when someone says something or they share something from their experience, I can I can see where that thing can go. I'm like, oh, okay, I can definitely talk about this. There's so much to say about this. And especially people when people share with me things that they go through from the heart, that's when I get my inspiration and I know that that thing is going to empower others and it's very easy for me uh, to share about it. So it's, it's very useful for me if I get to interact with people and I get to learn from them and they inspire me, I can give back to others as well. I love that. And I feel that when you're doing your videos, um, I follow you on Facebook, when you do your videos, they're so, they're just snippets of inspiration. They're you're so powerful and your your soul passes through to others um, somehow. So I appreciate that about you and thank you for being here. Maze on mute. Oh, thank you so, so much, Maze, for that. And I, I really believe that it comes from me being a people person. I can only work with people. I know someone asked me the other day, uh, could you work with people who have product-based businesses? And I'm like, well, I could help, but I don't think I could do such a good job as I do when working with people, with people who do services and helping them build up their brand because I, 
I get a lot of energy from their energy. I get a lot of inspiration by looking at the person, which is, of course, a living thing. If it's something that's really alive, that's when I get all my inspiration from. So I specialize in working with people the most. Jason, Mike is back to you. <laughs> well, thank you, Maze. I appreciate you joining the stage and, and, and asking that question. Uh, I want to make sure that we have answered all your questions. So do you have a follow-up question? Feel free. The stage is yours once again. My follow-up question is just, um, now that you've met Ziza, uh, share this with anybody you know, because Ziza is somebody that really helps you with that consistency. She does emails and following her has helped inspire me with my consistency. I don't know. It's like you never, it's endless content for you. And I did have a one more question. You say you connect with God. How do you connect? Do you meditate? What is it that you do that opens up that, that communication? I like to pray. I like to pray a lot and I'm not going to lie. I have a lot of faith and because of my faith, I'm able to just speak to God as if I were speaking to you, Maze. It's just a casual conversation where I share. This is what I'm struggling with. Please show me what to do. I have no idea what to do next. And I just speak from the heart as I do with other people because people are just God's creation. And I speak to him as if I were speaking to other people. I, I'm honest and I speak from the heart. And that's the easiest way for me to do it. I like to keep things uncomplicated. And I think it's, it's the same for everyone. If you can speak from the heart, you're able to find a lot of answers to your questions. I hope that helped Maze. All right. She's, <laughs> she's sending that emoji. So, so I, th I think we have covered Maze. So Maze, you know, is that, is that cool? Or do you, would you like to ask something else before I move to Thomas? Thank you so much for letting High me. five to you and thank you so much, Maze, for being here and being a part of the show. Uh, you will be on the podcast, okay? So uh, because, you know, we are recording it, you know, I, I will send you the episode link once it's uploaded. Uh, please listen to it, uh, the, the whole show. Share it with some of your friends and family members. That would be pretty cool. I want to welcome Thomas from Australia. I think it's around 5 a.m. AEST. Well, you know, how are you? And he's one of those regular fans, you know, who, who is always on the show. Okay. <laughs> At such an early hour. So, Thomas, you know, you know how, what is that you like to contribute today? Or do you have a question for Ziza? Hi. Hi, Jason. Uh, hi, Ziza. And hello, everyone listening. Um, I've been listening to Jason's podcast for probably the last two months i guess um i've found all of them all of them really interesting but just listening to ziza in the last 45 or so minutes i've yeah i've just blown away i've just find everything that that's been talked about questions comments statements um yeah just resonate and i, I i've i'm literally i'm not um well, I'm not speechless because my wife says I have verbal diarrhea, but <laughs> but I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Caesar. Um, you're uh, obviously a wonderful human being and uh, it's, it's lovely to hear someone from around the other side of the world. Um, I, I'm assuming you live in Romania, but I'm not sure because you speak like you might have lived in America for a while, but maybe you can answer that question. But before you answer that one, you talked about um, generalists versus expert um, or specific type of expert. I think, um, and, I, and you talked about you being a bit of both. And I, I think that's, I, I kind of agree with that. I think if you, if you were a very specific uh, one-sided expert, then you become a little bit um, not open to other opportunities to listen to other people. And I, I love the way you said that you um, bring in other other people or other 
inspiration, but you link it back to your area of, of, of human expertise. Uh, I think that's great. Um, I, I'll just give you one kind of funny analogy because I know you like analogies, but 23 years ago, I, um, I met my uh, future wife um, at, a, at a party. Um, I guess the more traditional way than what the kids do these days with all of this um, internet stuff. But after I met her, um, she invited me to, uh, about three weeks later, we went on a date. And then on the second date, she invited me to her place for a meal. And I loved that because I was a bachelor for about 20 years. Um, and I used to get a lot of what we call in Australia, takeaway food. And, um, I was being invited to this new friend's or girlfriend's house and she cooked this absolutely amazing meal. And I knew then that she was an expert in cooking. You know, she didn't use the recipe book. She just experimented. She, she cooked from the heart. And, uh, and that was probably one of the catalysts that um, made me want to keep dating her and obviously eventually married and, and we're still so we're still married 19 years later but um she was an expert you know level five in in cooking and and i was probably level one but but one other thing I, i'd also say is i i loved your your information about public speaking i was incredibly shy when i was at school i was called beaty because um i was red in the face what not because i looked like warren beaty but because I always got embarrassed. I got embarrassed every time I opened my mouth. But I think, as you said, as you, as you become more comfortable with yourself, with your sense of identity and, and progress more to like self-actualization that you end up becoming more comfortable at the things that you originally thought you were, were hopeless at. And, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give the mic back to Jason and, and yourself to say whatever you'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That's just such a great insight. And thank you so much for listening. And thank you for being a loyal listener to Jason's podcast. I'm, I'm glad that what I said resonated with you. And I love the analogy with the cooking. <laughs> I mean, I gave this example. Me and too. <laughs> I'm, that was uh, nice. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm so glad that you actually, this is how you met your wife. So it's such a nice, lovely story. And just to answer your question about my, uh, my accent, I was born and raised in Romania. And people usually ask me, how did you get that accent? Because it sounds a little bit American. Well, the truth is that cartoons used to air in English American when I was a child in the 90s. I would watch a lot of Cartoon Network. And it was just the original voices, American English. And since I have such a good musical ear, I'm able to pick up accents and pronunciations very easily. So this is how I got <laughs> my, my English, just by listening to cartoons. Lovely, lovely. I love it. Go ahead, Thomas. Oh, I just, I just, I'm fascinated by accents. Um, I obviously have an Australian accent, but I lived in England for a year uh, when I was 18. So my accent sometimes, when people listen, they think, oh, where's he from? New Zealand or Canada or whatever. But the people that are experts, you know, know the difference between an Australian accent and a New Zealand accent, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I, I love that because I knew, I knew you'd been impacted by, by something. And, uh, I love the fact that you listened to cartoons and, and you didn't have to travel outside your own home to speak, uh, a little bit more differently to the average Romanian. Thank you. Lovely, lovely. Thomas, do you have a follow-up question? Anything else you'd like to ask uh, before we start rapid fire questions? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to uh, for you to rapidly do whatever you <laughs> rapidly do, Jason. Oh, actually, you know what? I have one more person who have joined my stage on Clubhouse, virtual stage. Bombato, how are you? So nice to see you. Uh, you know, please unmute if you're available. Hi, and do you have a question for Ziza or would you like to contribute to this conversation? She's on Clubhouse, guys, by the way, guys. 
Yes, thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for the space. I appreciate it. And I learned so much. Ziza, oh my goodness, uh, so many takeaways, so many takeaways that I'd be chewing on uh, throughout uh, the day today. Um, uh, as you were talking, you talked about inspiration. Maze asked you about how your connection, how do you get the connection with God to get your inspiration? Uh, that uh, triggered a question for me about uh, intuition and uh, and the heart, because you know I get into uh, conversations with uh, people talking about intuition, and, and I'm just asking you: Do you think the intuition is in the heart, or the intuition is somewhere in your gut, and is that where God is? Like where, where, where do you place all of that uh, inside of yourself? Thank you. That is such a great question, and of course, this is my take on it, and I don't think anyone can give a real answer to this one. I think intuition is just God speaking to us because obviously he cannot send us like a letter that drops out <laughs> from the sky. So he will give us all sorts of hints and intuitive nudges are one of those ways that he communicates with us. But when I get intuitive nudges, they're a combination of coming from the gut and the heart as well. And they're probably connected also, but I'm a highly intuitive person and usually uh, when something is wrong or when something is not how it's supposed to be, I get a gut feeling. And when it's something that really lights me up, it's a real, it's a big yes. I can feel it in my heart and it feels like expanding. This is how I feel it in my body. But I think everyone experiences intuitive nudges differently. And I hope that answered your question, Mabato. Yes, it did. Thank you so much, uh, uh... Ziza and uh, yeah, it's interesting to 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 hear that everybody we all hear differently and and I think that's because God created all of us and so He knows exactly what language to speak to each one of us, right? So that's what I'm thinking. Uh, I'm in the parenting stay uh, space and do uh, my messages intuitive parenting because that's how I raised my son in a country in a society I did not grow up in. So I had to rely on my you know the deep voice inside of me to be able to raise him as a single parent. And so uh, so I raised him intuitively because I would always just dig inside, you know, like listen and say, Lord, help me. <laughs> In every moment, I'd, I'd pray this quick prayer. I'm sorry, quick prayer. Lord, help me. Uh, and, uh, and I would feel or hear a loud knowing inside of me. Uh, but it came deep inside of me, deep deep in my belly, uh, because I know it didn't go through my brain. But uh, anyway, so I was just wondering uh, about the heart because I, um, so it's good to hear that uh, different people uh, find, hear it differently because in my mind, I was thinking that the heart is more deceptive because the heart is where all of these uh, 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 fuzzy feelings come from, especially when you meet people and you meet, uh, 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 you want to get into relationships, it's the heart. And I always say that uh, saying follow your heart is the most, uh, uh, um, is the most, the, the least wise um, advice to give or the wise advice to take because the heart is just so deceptive. Uh, but so it's good to hear that, uh, you know, intuitive uh, 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 hearings come from different places with different people. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Lovely, lovely. Mabato, uh, do you have a follow-up question? I want to make sure we have answered all your questions before we move to rapid fire. No, no, I have everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Zizla. Lovely, lovely. Now, remember, rapid fire question is actually for everyone on stage, uh, including the guests. So let's start with rapid fire. Okay, now was that audio too low, Ziza, or was it too high? No, it was all right. <laughs> all right, all right. So rapid fire questions. So I got a few questions for my guest and one specific question for everyone on stage. So I'm going to start with the questions which I have for my guest. Okay, now Ziza, my first question is, what's your favorite smell? Coffee. Have to be quick. Coffee. Did you hear me? I said coffee. <laughs> oh. All right. Coffee. Question number two. How long do you think you would survive in a zombie apocalypse? 
not too long because I'm an awful runner. <laughs> <laughs> so can we give it like a day at least? No, I will probably die short of breath after, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay, next question. If you could choose to be any animated character, because you watched a lot of cartoons, who would it be? It's definitely Jerry from Tom and Jerry. Oh, nice. All right. Why? why? I'm just interested. I'm curious to know why. Because his personality is quite similar to mine. He's playful, but he, he's also very, he has a lot of love in him. Even when he plays around with Tom, he still loves Tom. And when Tom gets in trouble, he takes him out of trouble. So yeah, I'm quite similar to Jerry. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. Next question. What do you do when you typically get bored? When you typically get bored, what do you do? I rarely get bored. <laughs> I mean, there are so many things to do. There is no way you can get bored. But usually when I do that, I get out of the house. I go somewhere outside or I do something with my hands like paint or cook. I try to get myself out of that thing. But I don't really know boredom. I really <laughs> rarely get bored. <laughs> are you level five in your expertise in cooking? I wouldn't say quite level five, but somewhere around level four. I'm, I'm pretty close. All right. So, Thomas, your wife doesn't have a competition. <laughs> She's no, <not> a... <laughs> I would say mom is level five. But me, I sometimes, have, I sometimes have fails over there. So I would say I'm level four. <laughs> All right. One final question for you and one common for everyone. So last question for you, Ziza, is if you could remove one color from the whole world, what would it be and why brown is just so ugly <laughs> okay you know i agree with you okay because i also hate brown so i'm just wondering okay is there an incident which includes brown uh, and that's why you hate it so much no 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 incident it's just it's not my style it just doesn't excite me at all yep absolutely I, I agree with you 100% on this. So common question for everyone on stage. Okay. And these are, you have the option to skip and you know, buy some time if you like. Okay. So the question is, what does okay mean for you? It's lukewarm. It's mm, not exciting. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so okay, according to Ziza means lukewarm. Okay. So let's go with Thomas. Thomas on LinkedIn. What does okay mean to you? Okay means to me, it's a safe word, but it's a bit boring. It's sitting on the fence, but it's diplomatically polite. And um, yeah, it's a bit like the color brown. It's a bit boring, <laughs> but it's a bit... It's, But it's okay. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I love his But explanation. She'll be right. It's a safe word, right? It's a safe word. <laughs> Keeps you safe. Lovely, lovely. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Thomas? I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to cut you back there. Uh, no, it's okay, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that thomas and i i just wanted to personally say that you know all those compliments which you said about my show uh i am very very grateful it takes a lot of effort uh to put forward a podcast especially when you're trying to do this live guys it's very very challenging and this does require some level of expertise i'm not saying that i'm level five i think i'm at level three right now and trying to move to level five as we naturally progress with every season so thank you you know for your kindness your love and support uh, my show just in case if you're new to linkedin or clubhouse my show is broadcasted live every wednesday at 12 eastern standard time so let's move to maze maze uh i wanted to ask you the same question what would be your answer what does okay mean to you okay maze if you're available just flash your mic okay she's there go ahead maze. well we use in the grief world okay and that is our like go-to so it means uh 
really, you know, we're okay. It's fine. We don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> That's my to. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And Mombato, what about you? What does okay mean to you? Yeah, it's funny. I was like, Tom, I was going to say, okay to me is like brown to Ziza. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, it's, it's just boring. It is, uh, I don't know, for someone to say, okay, when I'm asking them something or sending them a text, it just comes across as, you know, somebody who doesn't want to engage, you know, it's a non-committal type of, uh, of, of an answer. And uh, yeah, it's boring. It's it's a brown. It's a brown for me. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. Elizabeth from LinkedIn, you know, she sent me uh, a message and she, she said, I think okay uh, means when I feel not very good enough or not with full power. Now that makes sense. Yes, so thank you so much for sharing that, Elizabeth. If anybody else who is on LinkedIn or Clubhouse, if you're not able to come up, you know, you can just drop me a message and I would be happy to read that, even if you have questions. So this is pretty cool. Okay, according to me, uh, you know, is like a safe word. Uh, I find it, uh, I don't find it lame or brown. I just find it very neutral. And uh, all right, no, it's, it's a safe word. I agree with Thomas. You know, it's it's a safe word. You know, you can use it with anybody without any issues. I feel the same thing. Anyways, so let's actually move on to the business side of things. Yes, Thomas. You know, you wanted to share something. Oh, just an ex just a, an interesting extension of the word "okay" to be a little bit detailed. Um, if I'm having an argument with someone or if I'm having an argument with my wife and you know after 19 years of marriage you, you do have the odd argument everyone does but we go back and forth and you know this comment that comment this comment and in the end I say a word which is quite powerful and that is whatever and I think the word whatever just sort of nails the basically to me whatever is it's like okay, but it's a bit more powerful than okay. It's it's saying, okay, whatever, you win. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know about you guys, but you know I think whatever or saying that whatever, I don't think it's a it's a safe word. It's a much more an unsafe word I, according to me. I think okay is a much more safer word, <laughs> but. It, it's a word that you say when you're a bit frustrated after after going back and forth. You're brown, I'm blue. You're brown, I'm blue. You're brown, I'm blue. <laughs> okay, whatever. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. I had a question, actually. I wanted to actually ask Ziza this question, and I wanted to actually showcase people in this world, and it's okay sometimes if you don't know a lot of things. And it's okay to ask questions that does not really make you stupid. So my question is, Ziza, I've seen on Clubhouse many people use the explanation mark as uh, as an emoji. Okay, I have no idea what that means. Would you mind sharing what that means? I have no idea what that means either. <laughs> I okay, so I see Mombato using it a lot of regularly. So, so Mombato, would you mind enlightening us? What does the explanation emoji means? I'm like you. I'm like you all. I didn't <laughs> know what the, the explanation is, and I just popped it up because you mentioned it. But what I have. I'm finding now as I'm watching people use exclamation marks, and this is now what I've adopted in using exclamation, the exclamation uh, uh, emoji is more like, a, okay, highlight what you just said, you know, kind of like, oh, highlight it, you know, just like you would use an exclamation mark when you write something. Uh, it's more like more of an emotional thing. You want to just highlight that word. And so that's how I use it. And that's how I think other people are using it that I've watched. It's like, mm. oh, yes, you know, more, more, there's, there's yeah, an emotion I behind agree. what they just said. I agree. I think is that. Exactly. All right. I want to yeah, get May's exactly perspective right. also because she's also throwing in exclamation marks as we speak. Mays, do you have another analogy towards exclamation marks, which we see on Clubhouse thrown at one another? I love this question. 
it's like, wow, that was pretty profound. Mm. Oh, I actually like that. I, 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 I think like that's, that. that's an easier yeah. explanation. I think that's what it is. Yes, thank you. Lovely, lovely, lovely. You know, let's actually give Ziza the opportunity to promote herself. So Ziza, the first thing which I want to ask you is that what is your business vision and where do you want to go ahead in the future and see yourself in the future with your brand? This is the first time I'm sharing this one publicly because I recently got super mega clear on what I wanted to do business-wise. And my big vision is to create a global PR agency for entrepreneurs and speakers and musicians as well, or artists, where I get to be their mentor in terms of showing up in front of people, building up their personal brand. So how do you show up when you start to get those media and visibility opportunity. So this is my big vision, something really global that supports business people who are more on the creative side of things and speakers as well. Lovely. I appreciate you sharing that big vision which you have there. And guys, everybody on stage, if you do get the opportunity today, you know, please send some prayers over to Ziza and let's, you know, give her the blessings and the courage and the encouragement, the knowledge the roadmap she requires to make this happen, the global PR agency. Thank you. And and Ziza, you know, my next question was, do you have any sort of upcoming events, speaking engagements or promotions you'd like to promote on this show other than the link which you have shared, which I have posted the Black Friday offer on the top. Uh, the Black Friday offer link is also posted on the event uh, notes. So, guys, if you're on LinkedIn, you should be able to see that Black Friday link. Ziza natur.ck.page forward slash Black Friday. If you're on Clubhouse, it's actually pinned on to the top. And if you're listening to this on podcast, you should have it on the show notes. Go ahead, Ziza. Thank you, Jason. So besides what you shared, which is a limited offer uh, that's going to end, I only share this one twice a year, this Black Friday offer which is a huge discount on a package of strategy sessions is for people who really want to amp up their visibility, but they don't know where to start. So they need a lot of strategy in their journey of uh, being more omnipresent. This is what this offer is about. And something else that I have coming up is an event that I host every month. Uh, this month is happening on the 22nd. This is a free event and it's also one plus one, so you can bring a friend with you. It's a business networking and public speaking practice party. I call it a party because every month we have a different theme and everyone dresses up and we practice improvised speeches with a partner in the breakout rooms. I teach you how to do improvised speeches and then you practice with everyone in the group. It's a lot of fun because it's the only place where you will ever be able to see an accountant giving speeches dressed up as Minnie Mouse. <laughs> so you have a lot of fun, you laugh a lot. So as I said, this month it's happening on the 22nd and the theme is all black since we're talking about Black Friday. So you can get as creative as you want with this outfit. You can dress up in leather or rock stars or Morticia Adams, whatever comes to you as long as it's black. That's your go-to outfit. And the link to register, I have the event put up on LinkedIn, but anyone who wants the, the details for that, they can just reach out and I can send them the link to register. And this one happens every month, as I said, with a different theme happening every month. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and guys, you should be able to find Ziza's profile uh, on the LinkedIn event itself. I usually tag all my guests. So if you're able to go through the description, you should be able to see the guest name, Ziza Natur. If you click on it, that should directly take you to that profile. Same goes with Clubhouse also. Okay, so thank you so much for sharing that. I wanted to quickly give people a, a little idea on brand identity because many people wonder why did I name the show Brand Identity Design because I'm a brand identity designer myself. So so just in case if you're unaware, guys, brand identity, uh, the textbook term, it's like a visual element of your brand such as color, typography, patterns, design, uh, sometimes even audio, it can be a jingle or can be a, you know, a, a larger than a jingle. Uh, it also includes a logos, primary, secondary and miniature favicon size logos. So the core concept of, of, of brand identity is to help you distinguish and identify 
uh, the brand in your consumer's mind. And a well-crafted identity, what it does, it just unifies and creates a system that just helps you to communicate your brand value towards your target audience in a very effective manner. So that's what I do. Uh, and that's what my specialization is. Uh, if you go through my website, so most of my event description does have links to my website. Please go through it. You should be able to find case studies uh, which you can look at. There are a few ways how you can actually support me as a designer. One solid way is to support me with my podcast because my podcast is actually the way how I market my business uh, through the visual and digital assets which I create like the event uh, uh, you know the uh, the flyers which you see uh, the music which I add those are some of the stuff you know which I use to promote and gain attention to myself so that's one way you can do it if you like my styling and my work you can hire me uh, you know, and I should be able to help you in building a unique brand identity. Uh, building an identity is very analytical. It's not just aesthetically, you know, just making things look cool. It's a very data-driven process and you have to be very strategic while doing it. So I wanted to personally take the time out and thank, uh, thank Ziza once again uh, for being here, uh, for sharing this wealth of knowledge answering all those questions, giving us all relevant examples. I have had so many guests so far, but by far, you're one of the most easiest when it comes to, you know, explanation and examples. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ziza, uh, you know, for being here on the show. I truly, truly admire uh, your expertise and I'll highly encourage people to take advantage of this uh, Black Friday offer. It's inexpensive. If you go through the web page, you should be able to see pricing, all the inclusions and everything else. Uh, not just that, I want to quickly give you a heads up on next week's show. Next week's show, Season 3, Episode 11. Uh, we're going to be speaking about being the face of multiple companies with Michelle Kopp. Uh, and the reason why we speak we specifically went ahead with this topic uh, think of Tim Cook or the guy at Google you know the face the people who are the actually face of the organization now remember the board of directors can actually take certain decisions and the person who is actually the face of the business can still have a negative effect so we have to have maintain uh, you know an emotional separation between the company and what we are representing and we have to wear multiple hats so we would be discussing about this i am just giving you an overview i don't really have the description of that event in front of me but i think if you go on to my profile you should be able to find it so on that note we're going to be wrapping up this show i wanted to thank each and everybody uh, who is on stage and who has been listening. Thank you so much for supporting uh, my show. You take care of yourself. Have a lovely morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Take care of yourself. Bye, Ziza. And thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you to everyone. You have been awesome. All right. So, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you there? Elizabeth? Hello? You know what, Ziza? Yeah, I, I, I think Elizabeth was trying to come up all this time. And, and she finally she was, showed yeah. up. <laughs> she's actually on stage. She's there. But she's not responding. You know, the things which happen. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you. Sorry about that, Ziza. I thought she wanted to come up. She was trying really hard. So, anyways, we're going to go back to the rap music again.